Hey, I'm here with Adam Mead, and I'm so grateful to be talking with you, Adam, and get to learn about how you got into Warren Buffett style and Charlie Munger style investing, because I found out that we're both going to Berkshire Hathaway, and I'm super excited to go and eager to looking forward to all of the events happening there. And I wanted to ask you, because I know you've been to Berkshire Hathaway for many years, what has your experience been like and how has it changed over time? And what do you look for when you go to these meetings? No, this is great, Michelle. It's uh, it's great to chat with you. I, I'm, I forget what I was searching for, but something about the meeting and your page came up, you know, what is it? MichelleMarkey.com. And I, I, I was, you had me fooled because I thought your level of detail and enthusiasm, I thought you were, you were a long time attender of the meeting. Um, so it, I was kind of surprised to, to hear that you were a first timer, but Great, great to chat and just, you know, I'm sure you have questions about the meeting. You've never been, you, you know, a little bit, of, you know, enough about it to, to be super excited, which you should be. And, you know, it's, it's hard to believe I'm, I'm a veteran at this point. I guess I could call myself that I've got every pass that I've been to uh, up on my wall here. And um, my first meeting was in 2012. So this will technically be 10 years, uh, 11 years, but uh ninth in person. So I guess I'll call myself a veteran. So, you know, we can just we can chat any questions you have about the meeting and we'll just kind of see where it goes and uh, talk Berkshire, talk business, talk stocks. It'll be fun. Yeah, that's awesome. And how was it like when you first went in 2012? So I, I had been wanting to go for a number of years. You know, this had been, you know, I, they didn't publicly, well, they've been recording them, but they hadn't publicly broadcast the meeting for years but you know so it was always this exciting like what what actually goes on at these meetings and i i finally just got sick of friends ba bailing out on me and i said you know what i'm, we're, I'm just going I'm just going to omaha by myself so i just bought a ticket showed up in in line on saturday at 6 a.m you know to get a good spot on the floor and bumped into some some uh some guys from cincinnati that were also there. They had been been going for a number of years, uh, and they basically invited invited me into their group, uh, invited me out to Gorat's for dinner afterwards, and we've been you know we're lifelong friends now, and I've stayed with them a, a number of years. You know we book book hotels together and and made our trips uh, together, and it's just it's 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 wonderful. So that that first year, you know, just head first into the Berkshire. Uh, Berkshire meeting and everything else that's around it. I mean, it's just, you have this official meeting from, you know, seven to seven in the morning to three 30 in the afternoon, but it's really the whole weekend and the whole city of Omaha gears up and it's just, uh, it's phenomenal. So I was addicted, you know, that first time that I, I showed up. That's awesome. And is it is it super crowded everywhere you go during the the weekend of activities? Like I can only imagine that maybe Gorats is totally booked, or you know how how do you kind of get into places if you don't know people already? You know, kind of knowing the way of the land. Berkshire puts a great package together. You know that that information book. You know, right on the Berkshire website, mm -hmm. and you know there's something going on at Nebraska Furniture Mart. There's something going on at Borsheim's and Everybody there, I, I wrote in the introduction to my book, you know, I, I immediately found I was among 40,000 friends and you really feel that way. I mean, everybody that's there is excited to be there. You know, I'd say probably a third of people you meet, it's their first time. You know, every time I've gone, it, I've met about a third of people say it's their first time. So there's a nice mix of new people you know, quote unquote, veterans or experienced, you know, long-term shareholders and everybody's just super friendly. They're excited to be out there. And th there, are, there are times and places where there's lines and it feels mobbed, but I, I guess it, it also depends on where you're from. You know, I'm, I don't consider myself a city person, but you know, I'm 40 minutes from Boston and, you know, lines and traffic and so forth are, you know, just a thing of life. And so I was surprised at how easy it was to get around and, you know, parking. It was almost like, you know, am I parking somewhere? I shouldn't because it's too easy. You know, the, the, the city's laid out in a grid, which is great. And just the Berkshire specific events, easy to navigate. A lot of people there to help you. You can kind of follow the crowds. And there's a lot to, there's a lot to happen to, to go to outside of the meeting, you know, both before and after. 
Uh, Whitney Tilson usually hosts a, a free and open event at the Hilton across the street, which you, know, you can literally just walk in and, and Whitney will buy you a beer. I mean, it just, it's, it's, it's pretty cool. It, it's really pretty cool. It's very open and, and welcoming. Wow. That's awesome. And, and I've heard Whitney Tilson talk on some of the preview of like Berkshire meetings when they're live streamed and he seems to have a lot of great insights as well. And um, that is pretty cool that, you know, they're so welcoming and there's so much going on that you can do and be part of. And it's wonderful that you've met lifelong friends there. And I'm kind of hoping to do the same of people who are like-minded type investors who like investing for the long term and having a holding period of ideally forever like Buffett and Munger do. And not that you necessarily have to hold securities forever. I mean, you know, they saw the story might change with what we might be invested in and then it might warrant to be sold and then invest in something else. But if, if we can make that right initial decision of investing a in a company that hopefully will be around for the next 100 years, then hopefully we've done you know, what we set out to do as investors, I would think. And, and I think that that's so special that, you know, like what I have come to find and trying to learn and study about what I perceive to be the greatest of all time investors is that investing this way is a way of life. And, and I'm super excited about it because like you said, it's like, um, you know, people who are so welcoming and, and open and, uh, and I think that's a wonderful community to hopefully build more camaraderie in and also show more people that they can invest this way. Like um, people don't have to just be guessing at investing that there is a methodology and approach that makes sense and has done really well for these investors. So it should be able to help many more people, I would think. You do get a few people out there that are sort of I'll call it spectators, you know, geez, I got to come because Warren Buffett's going to die next year. And, you know, they. <laughs> They're just sort of, you, you can tell they're not going to come back, but the vast majority, 99% of the people there are just, it's just wonderful. And to your point, you know, you, you really, when you walk through this 200,000 square foot exhibition hall, you realize it, which is populated with all, you know, most of Berkshire's businesses, uh, even Coca-Cola has a little exhibit there because uh, Berkshire owns about 9% of the Coca-Cola company. Kraft Heinz has a little exhibit. You, you really it really cements the fact that you own businesses and it's, it's really, it's just really cool to have, and you call it quote unquote access to all these people that you read about. You know, I've, I've met, um, you know, Irv Blumpkin of, of Nebraska Furniture Mart, um, Tony Nicely of Geico, uh, Kathy Ireland was out there one, one year. She's not part of Berkshire, but she's, you know, kind of associated with it. You know, the, the CEO of, of BNSF Railroad, uh, which has a really cool exhibit out there, um, an even interactive exhibit. I mean, it's, it's just it's fun, and you, you, I mean, it's like unparalleled access, and and even, even sort of beyond the quote unquote big names, you know, you go to any of these booths that are set up. I mean, two years ago, I was talking to the woman that was at the Johns Manville booth, and Johns Manville is a building products insulation company, and. Turns out she is the assistant to the the CEO, and she was telling me, you know, all about different aspects of John's Manville, and just the the the, the managers who are there and the employees who are there are as excited to have shareholders there, and so it's just this sort of mutual, you know, Charlie I think has characterized it as as a celebration, and it really is sort of this celebration, fun time. Warren certainly wants you to buy products. I don't get me wrong, he's. They're there to sell some products and Nebraska Furniture Mart does, you know, tens of millions of dollars a day in business from shareholders, but it's, you really feel like you're part owner of a business. And that's probably the, the biggest takeaway. Well, that's amazing. And, and, and I think that's such a great feeling to have is that, you know, a lot of times maybe people can feel detached from what they own. Like if, if people are speculating in the markets, they might just buy a stock like I've done in the past simply because when I didn't know better, it offered a dividend. So I just bought that stock because it had one of the higher dividends, but I didn't feel much of a connection to that company whatsoever. So the difference with a lot of Berkshire products and offerings is that you truly feel valued as not only maybe a customer, but also as a part owner and, and someone who has a vested stake in the future 
uh, progress and financial performance of the company. And, and I think that's amazing because I think Warren Buffett stands for really great moral principles that a lot of people hopefully would want to strive toward and budding as well. And, and I think that's amazing that it's it's one of the maybe few places where you can feel like it's it's great to be a business owner and a shareholder. And you know, sometimes maybe you might not get that same experience in holding other kinds of stocks. Yeah, it, it really sort of sets the standard for how a business can and should be run and and the relationship with shareholders and, and shareholders are a very important part of Berkshire's culture. You know, the managers there know that they can make long-term decisions and the vast majority of owners are not going to say, you know, sell the subsidiary or, or do, do something that, that other, other corporations might. So can I flip the script on you and just ask, you know, what your background is? Cause I know it's, it's not investing. How did you get involved in, in Berkshire? And how, how did you, how did you catch this bug? Cause you clearly have it pretty strong, Michelle. Well, I uh, I found out about it because some years ago, you know, as like a lot of millennials, I wasn't fully sure what I was doing with investing. And I read one book about how index funds were great. And I did that in my earlier 20s. And it did well. Like, don't get me wrong. I was in a bunch of index funds and ETFs for a while. And then part of what I realized was, you know, I feel like I'm not making as aggressive of financial progress as I would like to make. If I'm in, in a bunch of index funds and ETFs, that's well and good, but it can I do something more to try to expedite being able to potentially retire earlier someday? And then um, one day when I was driving to work, I was kind of wondering, like, how can I expand my financial education? And I came across this podcast by Danielle Town and Phil Town. And when I found their podcast called Invested, and they also have a book together called uh, Invested as well. And when I came across those things, I felt that my whole life was transformed because it, they exposed me to way more investors who are disciples of Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger. And Phil Town patiently explained to his daughter, Danielle, about how he's been investing like the greats for more than 40 years in basically what some people call value investing, but I try not to stick too closely to that term because value investing can sort of mean different things depending on if there's like a mainstream definition of it compared to you know, what I think is getting more at Warren Buffett's style. And I think Warren Buffett has also somewhat evolved. Like there's, there's been differences in how he started out with more Benjamin Graham and he's evolved to incorporate more of Charlie Munger's principles or other people's ideas into how he invests. And so that listening to that podcast just opened up a whole new world of possibilities to me. And I'm super grateful to the towns for what they put out into the world because I wouldn't have arrived at this style of investing if if they hadn't introduced me to, you know, both Warren and Charlie and then also Guy Spear and Monish Pabrai in the books that they've published. And those are also really awesome to look into and read about. And I, I realized that this is what I'd like to do. Like, I didn't just want to be someone who was just guessing at investing. Like I wanted to make, you know, really thoughtful, um, careful decisions about where I put my money, because I also learned that, you know, where you're putting your money is a vote for your um, values. And so if I'm putting my money with some company, I'm voting for that company to do well in the future. And then I'm basically saying by investing my money that that company aligns with my values. So that's basically what got me into investing in this way a few years ago. And, and I'm just super grateful that I was able to be enlightened that way. That's awesome. That's awesome. So, so you're, you're clearly taking to the next step by actually coming to the Berkshire meeting. So if you want to take a minute and just chat about like, you know, how you're getting there, you know, it might be helpful to people because I'm sure a lot of people have made plans, but there might be people that haven't made their plans at this point. But, and I'm happy to talk about my, my trip as well. Yeah. So the way I'm getting to Berkshire is by plane. And, and like I talked about in my video about this, I said that people should try to book their travel arrangements and lodging as soon as possible because um, you know, I'm sure a lot of those in the hospitality industry know that thousands of people will be descending upon <laughs> Omaha in this particular weekend. So it would behoove people to try to, you know, set this stuff up as soon as possible. And 
you know, if you look at some flights, even a few months ago when I started looking, a lot of it was already pretty high. Like you'll pay in the high hundreds or low thousands just if you fly in either from Friday through Sunday. And that's that's pretty hefty. I mean, I'm sure some people it's fine to do that, but um, if if it's a little bit of a sticker shock, then you know, one thing some people might be willing to do is maybe fly in not exactly on the meeting days, but maybe a day or two before and after so that you can save a little bit on your flights. And then if if you feel like flying is not cost effective, then maybe it would be a worthwhile road trip for some people. I, I know rental cars are a little bit pricey these days with you know all of the supply chain and other shortages that we're going through, but you know, maybe people want to make it a fun trip. Like I've never been to Iowa or Nebraska. So I'm looking forward to seeing these states just because, you know, I've, I've yet to add them to my states to visit list. And uh, so I'm excited to check out, you know, what's there. And, and also with lodging, I mean, people have been booking uh, hotels and stuff through various sources and Berkshire also offers their suggestion. Of course, they're going to pitch their American Express travel arrangements, but if you don't want to go with that, then of course there's Airbnb. If if some people also want to save that way, you know, for anyone who's a budget conscious traveler, and and I'm also curious what your uh, ideas are. Yeah, no, I've um, so I I live uh, in New Hampshire, southern New Hampshire. There's an airport in, in Manchester, so I, I I drive myself crazy every year. Um, are you flying into Epley, into Omaha? I think the main one, yeah, the main yeah. Uh, airport there. Yeah, Epley. So, so, uh, so I can choose from the Manchester Airport or Boston Logan, you know, which is an international airport. Um, that's on the sort of departing end, and then on the call it the, the the Berkshire side, you can you can obviously fly right into Omaha. And as you said, the airlines know this, the hotels know this. Every single year, I mean, supply and demand, they're they're going to be jacking up the prices. Um, but Warren has actually suggested flying into Kansas City, which is about a two and a half hour ride. And I've done that oh, probably three times. And I'm doing it again this year. Just the, the, the airlines from year to year are just slightly different. And so I, I'm, I actually found it's pretty rare from where I live to find a direct flight, but a direct flight from Boston to Kansas City, which the at the cheapest flight that I could find was $57. Wow. And the, the round trip, I think was like, I don't know, 200 all in, but I have to rent a car to your yeah. point. So I have to pay to park at Logan, fly to, to Kansas City, but it's I tell you, if, if anybody's listening, if you haven't booked your flight, check out the Kansas City option. You know, one, it's a, it's a it's a really cool city in itself. I've actually stayed there the night after the meeting before flying back. You know, you get the barbecue. It's 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 cool. But if you haven't been, to your point, you know, checking out these different states, it's really it's beautiful countryside. I mean, that that two and a half hour ride goes by really quick, and um, and then you have a car while you're while you're there and you don't need a car you know i don't know if you're renting a car michelle but uber the last couple of times i've been uber has just been super easy they're all over the place super easy to navigate so kind of get creative and i think actually people can fly into des moines is it des moines mm -hmm. that's right there in iowa which is yeah, about two hours away to too that. yeah i would i so, would think that that's like decent to fly into as well yeah, so you can get creative, and and you know I'm I'm flying in Thursday, flying out Sunday, so like you said, you you can you can extend it to sort sort of get that non off peak uh, travel, and then um, you know hotels. I, this this is the first year I'm doing an Airbnb, staying with a couple of guys, so much cheaper than the hotels. You know the hotels. There's some pretty good ones too. Uh, I've stayed in Bellevue, which is maybe 20 minutes south of Omaha nice little, I think it's called micro tell used to be down there, but uh, that's a nice option. People can check out. No, well, that's great. Yeah. And, and, and I hope, um, I mean, I know things have been a little iffy with um, what's gone on the last couple of years, but I hope there's still enough drivers around and things like that. I'm, I'm sure there has to be, I mean, and, and otherwise I know there's um, I'm sure there's public transportation or other kinds of, you know, vehicle um, rental type stuff available so i'm hope i'm hopeful that people will be able to get around yeah and, and most of the action sort of takes place 
near the CHI Center. So I'll just do a little plug for, uh, I'm on a panel on Friday, which is at the, I think it's the TD ball field, which might be the Schwab ball field now, but that's right across the street from the CHI Center. Um, there's actually a sky bridge that connects the Hilton and there's a lot of events at the Hilton as well. So you're, you're pretty close to a lot of stuff anyway. Um, I suspect you'll have no problem with, with Ubers and, and even, you know, again, you, you start hanging out with people, they might invite you to sort of join their group and say, Hey, we've got a car or we're sharing a, sharing an Uber, you know, why don't you come with us? And getting around really is not that difficult, especially if you're come from any kind of, any kind of city environment, you're going to find it a breeze. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be good. Well, that sounds great. And a uh, real quick question on also the events there. Have you been to the exhibit hall the day before on the Friday and what's that been like to maybe shop around or, you know, are, um, is that, is that where there's also more panel events like what you're doing or just more like shopping? No. So, so, um, so that, that, that you're referring to the Friday shopping event at the CHI Center. They, they started that a couple of years ago because it was just I mean, crazy to, to get, there was lines, you know, during the, the day of the event. I think it just made it easier and nicer for shareholders to be able to do that the day before. That's, that's Berkshire specific, Berkshire sanctioned, if you will. Um, there's, there's that event, there's the meeting itself, and then there's, uh, I, I don't think they're actually, they're, I don't know if they're having, they used to have a tent at Borsheim's. I don't think they're having that this year with like a cookout. And then Nebraska Furniture Mart had a cookout. Those were sort of the Berkshire sanctioned events, if you will. Mm -hmm. And then this, this whole weekend, Michelle has sort of just grown up around it, you know, panels. There's a great, I don't know if they're doing it this year. I suspect they are. There's a great panel, I th usually on Friday at like 3 PM at, um, Creighton University. They have a nice little panel. That's free. You can just you can just come. I don't know if you need to sign up beforehand, uh, but you can check that out. Uh, their value investing class puts it on. Uh, there's a couple of paid seminars, if you will. Um, I think it's Bob Bob Miles puts on a paid seminar. You know, some of these which are like into the thousands of dollars. Some private events. I mentioned the Whitney Tilson event. I think he usually hosts one on Friday and Saturday, right after the meeting as well. And then just, you know, downstairs in the Hilton, they have a nice little lounge, lounge area bar. Shareholders are, are hanging out there, uh, you know, outside of the meeting. Most people wear their lanyards anyway, and 95% and of the people that you meet are shareholders that are there too. So, you know, it's just, it's just natural, you know, meet up with people. What do you think? What do you think of the meeting? What do you think he's going to say? That kind of thing. Um, and then downtown, uh, old market in, in Omaha is really, really cool. Uh, restaurants, bars. Um, there's a little candy shop that Bill Gates and, and, and Warren went to at one point and there's like a little cardboard cutout of them and all the kinds of cool old candies and you can get a milkshake there. I mean, just, there's, there's a ton to do. It, it's not, it's not just the meeting. And I think that's the thing that people that say, Oh, I'll just watch it online sort of miss all these events, but also sort of that, that camaraderie and right. that kind of thing. Yeah. And that's awesome. Thanks for sharing all that of all that there is to do. I mean, it's, it sounds super exciting. I mean, it's like the best of both worlds of like maybe a conference and also kind of like a world fair and, you know, kind of just, or like a carnival in a way, like it, there's so much kind of to do. And and I think um, I noticed in the agenda that Nebraska Furniture Mart is having a picnic after the meeting. So um, so I, I, I'm guessing that that's the cookout you might've been mentioning of of what they might, might do maybe after the meeting. Yeah, I've actually never been to that cookout. I know it's, it's, uh, it, it's good and it's worth, it's worth going to, you know, and, and certainly checking out Nebraska Furniture Mart, you know, if you know anything of its origins, you know, started mm -hmm. with $500 by Rose yeah. Blumpkin into this enormous store. It's just really a sight to see. And then Borsheim's, yeah, the, the events have changed over the last couple of years as Warren has aged. So uh, my, I think it was my first year, year there. Pretty sure it was my first year. I went to Borsheim's 
you can just you know again browse the jewelry store people buy some stuff they they give discounts it's kind of fun um but they used to like warren would do like ping pong with bill gates and then uh this young woman who ariel singh i think was her name she won the national ping pong championship they had a little event there this guy bob hammond did you know blindfolded chess against 10 different players warren used to go through and do his sort of crazy warren sales pitch mm. um that first year i actually got to shake his hand because i just happened to be in this little area that was there but um he doesn't do that anymore but mm -hmm. um again you you can go you know you might meet some of the managers that are there if you I, i've never been but you can go to the airport i think saturday afternoon i might have this wrong but you can check out a netjets plane like right on the tarmac and just go in it i mean it's just, it's super cool there, there's a there's there's more things to do than you do than you have time yeah, it sounds like it. Well, well, that's amazing. And, and thanks for sharing that. And uh, may I ask about your background of how you got into investing like this? Yeah, geez, I kind of like you. Um, you know, I, I had always been a, around business. I grew up around a, small business owners, uh, had a couple of small businesses myself selling firewood and had a little welding business in college. And so I, I'd always kind of been around it, but I never took like a specific, like high school we had business classes we could take, but I never, I never took those. It was only until college that I really kind of got on this business track. Um, and eventually like everybody in business or investing, you're going to hit Warren Buffett at some point in time. And just like you, Michelle, it, it just took, I just fell in love with it. It was like, this is the guy, you know, this makes total sense. He's legit. He's not, you know, some salesman or something and um, just fell in love with it. And I think the, my first real entry into Berkshire was um, Robert Hagstrom's book, uh, The Warren Buffett Way, which I've probably read or listened to that, you know, a dozen times. And, um, and, and he might actually be at the meeting. I met him one year, he was, he was signed some books. So, you know, you meet all these, these Berkshire connected people. It's kind of cool to see them in person. Um, but that was my first entry into Berkshire. And then one thing led to another, you know, I, I was, eventually went into commercial banking and just and sort of parallel track had this investing hat on and looked at banking through my lens of, of investing and it just grew to sort of dominate my life and at some point I just had some people ask me to manage their money and I said well if I'm going to do it I'm going to do it you know above board let the bank know about it I also went out and got registered as an investment advisor so I could actually manage their money officially and uh beginning of 2020, I struck out on my own to do it full time. And here we are a couple of years later, you know, still with the Berkshire bug, wrote, wrote this book that I've got behind me that, that just kind of happened uh, over a five year period. And um, here I am today. So it's, uh, I, I, I haven't lo lost that enthusiasm. And it's great, you know, people like Guy Spear and Monish Pabri have become friends of mine. And, you know, they still have that excitement about Berkshire and just that love of business ownership and investing and and above it all, sort of these human values of just being a good person and, and all of that self improvement and uh, just fell in love with it. And and so you're, you you kind of hit the nail on the head, Michelle. It's it's a lifestyle, for sure. Well, that's awesome. And I also look forward to checking out your book sometime. And that's amazing that you put together that book and devoted a lot of time and energy to doing that. So I also wanted to congratulate you on that accomplishment. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll be at, uh, I'll be at the bookworm. Uh, Warren has chosen my book to be sold at the meeting. So I'm going to try to spend uh, as much time as I can actually there, you know, signing copies and, you know, meeting people. So I uh, would love, love to meet you in person. Yeah. Well, I, I hope to be there. When are you going to be at the bookworm? So I'm on a panel on Friday, like I mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, Gabelli hosts a panel on, on Friday. There's a couple different segments, including Tom Gaynor of, uh, of Markel uh, and, and Mario Gabelli himself, I believe at noon. So I'm going to stay for some of those and then head over to the, the CHI center, probably, you know, early afternoon on Friday. Uh, maybe do a little shopping myself. I, I usually buy myself a new pair of shoes, Brooks shoes every year so I can keep up my, my Berkshire swag. Um, <laughs> um, so hope to see everybody there. 
Okay, and um, so the bookworm, I'm guessing, is not too far from the CHI Health Center. I haven't looked uh, at it on a map, but sounds like it's pretty close. So, uh, so they have a physical store, you know, their actual regular operating store. The bookworm has a little store, a little exhibit booth. I say little, it's actually pretty big inside the meeting itself. So I'll actually be in, in the CHI Center oh, exhibit okay. hall. Yep. Okay. All right. Yep. Okay. That's good to know. Good to know that you'll be in the CHI Health Center and not quite at the um, bookstore itself where it's located. Okay. All right. Good. Yep. Try to find you there. Yeah, for sure. Yep. Just, uh, you know, look, look for the book. I'll, I'll be here. It's, it's not, a, it's, it's pretty tight. I mean, there's, there's a number of different books and I mean, you're going to love the the exhibits are just wonderful. Um, you'll, you'll find it. There's big, big banners and things. And it's, it's just a very fun atmosphere. Well, awesome. Well, that's amazing. And uh, thank you, Adam, for telling me about that. And uh, also, I wanted to ask your thoughts on what do you think about Charlie Munger stepping back as chairman of Daily Journal? And what do you think is going to be, you know, kind of going on there in the future of DJ Co? Yeah, you know, I've, um, I, I've owned one share for a while just to get the annual reports. And um, I went out there in 2016, uh, which was kind of a cool, it was, it was a nice little intimate event, you know, compared to Berkshire, it was tiny, you know, just a couple hundred people and got to shake his hand, which was, which was, you know, the highlight of the whole trip. But, you know, I'm, I'm not surprised. And it's, it's sad to see sort of the, the end of the era. But, you know, I watched his, uh, the recent shareholders meeting, you know, a couple months ago or a month ago. So, and um, I mean, the, the man is 98 years old. It's just incredible incredible how his mind is but it, it doesn't surprise me that he's stepping down and it, it's it really i i love how he set this example by you know for this this whole entire time that he has been chairman of, of daily journal he's not taken any any kind of salary any kind of pay director's pay anything so he's done this work he's invested and made you know a couple hundred million dollars for for daily journal shareholders turned this thing around and now he's actually donating the stock that he owned to incentivize uh, fu future owners. So I, I'm not, I'm not as expert on the company itself. I mean, I, I know what they do. I know this sort of general transformation from legal newspaper to electronic court integration type of technology, but I can't really speak to it. So I, I'm, I'm sure they're going to be in really good hands. You know, Charlie is not going to choose the next generation of leadership, uh, you know, on a whim and, and certainly Jerry Saltzman outgoing CEO, s same thing, you know, hard to replace, but they're going to do the right thing. And, you know, in, in many ways, I don't, you know, it'd be, be a good model for Berkshire. I don't think Warren's going to donate a stock to, <laughs> to Berkshire shareholders or uh, Berkshire managers, but just this idea of sort of being above this corporate, you know, mania or, or craziness of, of taking everything you can. Uh, it doesn't surprise me that he's setting this good example, s stepping down. Yeah, and and to your point, um, you know what I've learned about is sometimes companies have a mercenary CEO type where they're kind of just in it to enrich themselves. But when you come across a great company where the you know top leaders of it have no need for more financial enrichment, I mean, you know, at both Charlie and Warren being billionaires, they don't have a need for more and and I think what gives them more joy instead of enriching themselves is still being able to get some good deals. Like Charlie has no qualms in that daily journal meeting talking about how he went to Costco and got $7 flannel shirts or $7 pants. And, you know, he was happy with that. Like, you know, it's, it's sometimes the little things in life. Like I know Warren Buffett's one splurge is probably his, his like, you know, interest in airplanes. But I think that um, overall they, they both, try to live as frugally as possible. And I think that's one of the best lessons in life that people can learn is that it doesn't matter how rich you are, you know, you, you want to have a purpose driven life and, and be able to help out people and, and do the, do the best possible. And, you know, kind of like what more could anyone ask for? So I think it was, you know, super great to, to hear Charlie, if, if that's the last daily journal meeting he'll ever have or speak at, it was great to, hear some of his outgoing wisdom about 
you know, how some of the root causes of a lot of human misery are envy as opposed to greed. And, you know, if, if people can find a way to, you know, remove themselves from this feeling of envy and rather strive for, you know, a, a higher calling, then hopefully, you know, people can realize that they have it within themselves and can develop the skills to accomplish anything they want. And they, they don't have to be envious or trying to keep up with the Kardashians or the Joneses and in trying to pursue, you know, whatever it is in life that they like to achieve. So, you know, I think it's wonderful how much that they've taught so many people. And, and I remember that that's what Warren wants to be known for is, is more as a teacher rather than this legendary investor that he is, even though, you know, of course we all know him as an investor, but he would prefer being known as a teacher as far as I know. Yeah, that, that's right. You know, these, these guys have just set set so many examples and they're clearly, you know, just masters of business and investing. But I, I think that's what, you know, if, if, if I had 10 seconds to say something to someone that wasn't familiar with, with Warren and Charlie, it's like, there's so much more than just business and investing. You know, it's, it's these life lessons. And, you know, one of my most cherished books here in my shelf is, you know, my signed copy of poor Charlie's almanac. And it's just goes beyond the investing to just being a good human, you know, philosophical, you know, just uniting all of this wisdom that's, that's around us and just being, being a good human and, and that, you know, directly be, being a, being a good business owner means being a good human. And, um, you know, and, and he's even said to his credit, you know, don't copy me on some of these, these other things, like, you know, he didn't get his share of humility or, or what have you. So just so much more to take, take away from both of those guys. Yeah, for sure. And, and I appreciate that. It's, it, it's true. I'm, I mean, they, they're great role models for what type of human we'd like to be. And, and I'm, I'm super grateful to them and, and also you, because it, it's great to know someone like you, who you've been really dedicated to um, knowing a lot of things, Charlie and Warren. And, and that's amazing that you have a signed copy of Charlie's Almanac. That's a wonderful book too. And hopefully, you know, more people can read and learn about you know, the psychology of human misjudgment that Charlie put out there as, as some of his maxims of, you know, the kinds of human nature follies that we want to avoid. And hopefully, you know, by avoiding silliness and foolish decision-making, hopefully we end up ahead in life because I'm, I'm guessing that's, that's part of the, the key in life is that with so many Americans living paycheck to paycheck, if, if they could just ingest some of these lessons that you talked about with Warren and Charlie, that they would be so much better off if, if they could adopt some of those practices. Yeah. And, and they, they live by example. I mean, Charlie's a little bit more, call him a spendthrift, if you will. You know, he's got his boat and some real estate and stuff like that. But, you know, Warren still lives in the same house that, that he, uh, he bought in 1959, I think it was, or 57, which, you know, another thing you can do is is drive by his house, you know, you'll miss it the first time. It's not, it's, it's not exceptional. Yeah. I, again, just their example of, of living and just, it's, it's actually much more enjoyable that way. You know, he talks about having a couple of different houses. You got to worry about upkeep and people stealing from you. And I mean, it's just, it's really just about having, having a good life. Um, but you know, for the, for the average person, you know, even if you index, right, just understanding the fact that, okay, I'm just setting in it, forgetting it, and I'm doing nothing, but I'm still an owner of all these businesses through this index fund, I think helps, helps just calibrate what you're trying to accomplish. You know, it, it doesn't have to be dedicating your life or, or your weekends or your nights, you know, trying to get up on accounting and study balance sheets and income statements and find good stocks. You, know, you, you, can, you, can, you can be a part of this Buffett Munger world and still be a passive investor you know, I think there's a place mm -hmm. place for that as well. Yeah. And, and I mean, I know Warren has recommended for most people to do the S&P 500 and you can't really go too wrong with that. Like he says, to never bet against America. But the, the one thing that I'm curious about is what do you think about if, if you think that some market is like some of the market could still be close to some of its all time highs and maybe some stocks may or may not be overvalued or, you know, I'm just kind of curious what your thoughts are on that. And, you know, if you think that uh, some indicators like the Buffett indicator of the Wilshire to GDP has any merit or the Schiller price to earnings, like the CAPE ratio, if, if that, you know, might suggest where we could be in the market still. Yeah, I mean, I generally try to avoid 
market predictions, but I, you know, it, it, it depends. And there, there's all these little nuances with these things where, you know, if you look at, depending on which index you, you look at, you, you know, the, the top five stocks might make up, you know, 25% of the market cap. And so you might have by one of those metrics, you know, an overvalued market, but then some of the, some of the other companies down further down might, might actually be a good value. So, um, and you really sort of have to dig in. I, I'm a bottoms up investor. So, you know, there, there are times and, and now generally maybe that time where things are a little bit on the expensive side. There's, you know, Howard Marks has this sort of good tool of like, you know, just taking the temperature of the market. Like how are credit markets? Are they tight? Are they loose? Um, is there speculation going on? You know, which we, we see that. We see this excitement with Bitcoin. Um, but that doesn't mean that they're, the markets are going to crash tomorrow, right? I mean, you can have a situation like, to use a specific company, uh, Microsoft or even Coca-Cola, you know, Microsoft and Coke sort of rode up in the 2000s, got super expensive. And then the stocks kind of traded flat as earnings uh, caught up to the stock price. You don't, you don't necessarily have to have a large drop. And then just structurally speaking, I mean, when you think about the change in the constitution of companies moving from more of a fixed capital to intangible capital and what that does to their balance sheet in terms of these ratios and how they are represented in the economy today. You know, the, the Buffett indicator, I mean, I look at that stuff too, uh, don't get me wrong. Um, and it seems to be flashing these red signals, but there, there's also to sort of remember, there are changes that have happened over the last 30, 40, 50 years including ownership of stocks. I mean, people used to have defined benefit plans. Now they own companies directly through 401ks and so forth. And so maybe it makes sense that instead of four to 6% of GDP as an appropriate level for the stock market, you know, or, or profit margins, you know, maybe it should be more. Um, maybe this ratio should be 125%, uh, you know, stock market to GDP. Um, there's, there's, there's enough questions there that lead me to say, like, you know, you can't use it, you know, and I'm not suggesting that you are, um, you know, you, you can't say, okay, it hits this level, short everything or, or go to cash. You know, my, my sort of antidote to that is take the temperature, but always be a bottoms up investor. And that's, that's just my approach. But you know, if someone's, if someone's index fund uh, investing and they they are just taking that complete passive approach, you know, just, just recognize that, your your discipline now also has to translate into when it inevitably you know crashes or declines and just just know that that consistency will balance things over time and sort of just forget about trying to time it um because if you did and, and i i mean i'll be the first to admit i mean i was wrong and in the beginning of 2020 i really thought we were going to have something far worse than we did and you know if i had bet on that sort of macroeconomic conclusion, you know, I would have been in a, a much worse place. Yeah. And that's a great point. Like I, I was actually also wondering or thinking if that might have been the big one of, you know, massive declines like we may have seen during the Great Recession. And and yet it it was sort of a short lived, you know, downfall. And then as soon as uh, I guess there was the government intervention of stimulus, it seemed to prop up things again and there was less fear. But at the same time it's as all things in economics, it seems like you can't have one outcome without another thing also happening. So, you know, maybe that's part of the reason why we might have higher than, you know, expected inflation over the last decade that we're seeing now. And uh, maybe that shouldn't be so surprising that it may be a natural outcome of what a lot of people are perceiving a significant amount of government stimulus in both fiscal and monetary policy to help prop up the economy. And in some ways, like I remember Buffett saying that it seemed to have worked. Like, I think he said this at the 2020 meeting or 2021, where, you know, the stimulus did help a lot of things with the economy come back. And that was great. Like a lot of people got jobs again, but it's also like, at what price um, is that? Like, it's kind of like wondering if, if the intervention that was needed at that time also opens up another can of worms where, you know, depending on how this inflation story plays out, that 
um, I'm I'm thinking and guessing that the Fed will have to raise rates more aggressively as as it seems like inflation isn't abating all that much. So um, that and some other you know kind of temperature taking indicators to me are things like corporate debt is sort of at its all time high levels from what I can tell and and also. Um, Income inequality has also never been higher like the other times from just looking at some charts. It looks like income inequality also happened during some of the other, you know, big busts of the Great Recession and Great Depression and also um, just the amount of buybacks. So it tends to be that when there's more corporate buybacks, it tends to be kind of like peaking at certain points. And then as we're declining, corporate buybacks tend to reduce. So I'm wondering if we may have peaked in corporate buybacks in 2021 with the amount of kind of cheap money that there was available, because I've also read to some extent that some companies have borrowed in order to afford some buybacks. So I don't know how big of a deal or not that is, but I also remember Howard Marks saying that the worst of loans are made in the best of times. So I don't know if he was talking about kind of this past recent period where you know, of course, most people who wanted any kind of loan or debt could have taken it on pretty easily, I would think, in the last couple of years. But I wonder at what point, you know, the circle will come back to potentially bite them, you know, when it's not opportune. So that's the other thing. I'm just, I'm trying to be a little bit defensive. And and I think that your approach makes sense of trying to be more of a bottoms up type investor. And I, I'll try to keep that more in mind. And, you know, like Buffett and Munger do, they invest regardless of whatever's happening at the macroeconomic level. Yeah, I, I would, th those kind of things, you know, they fall into the category of interesting, but, you know, unactionable. Like there, there's, you want to keep a general sense for all these things. And I mean, I saw it even three years ago when I, when I left banking, credit markets becoming super accommodative, you know, these covenant light deals or no covenants, which, you know, covenants are protections to, the investors, uh, whether a bond investor or a bank, and you know that that dip that we had in, in early 2020, really it was too quick. You know, really, if if it had gone on six months, I think the pain would have been more positive in the sense that some of the the poor companies would have been fleshed out. Um, you know, there's there's sort of this regenerative effect of recessions and, and even attitudes. I mean, when you look at, look, look at the stock market, I mean, just the, say the S and P, I mean, I think it was 2018 was the last down year in, in the last 10 years. So th there, there are these risks that sort of, it's almost like a, like a earthquake, you know, the pressure is going to build and at some point it's going to give, and maybe it's, maybe it's an even, distribution. Maybe it's that slow burn, like I talked about with uh, earnings at, at Coke, sort of just catching up and the stock not nosediving. Um, but, you know, you, you really, I mean, for me, it's just going back to finding good businesses. And that, to, to me, you know, my approach hasn't changed at all because of this. I always had kept in mind inflation can pop, pop into, come back, um, which, you know, the, the businesses that you want to buy as, as a value investor, at least, you know, for me, you know, the better businesses are already going to have that inflation protection. You know, I'm, I'm always looking for those risks. Um, I do own uh, two financial companies, not including Berkshire, uh, including one bank and, you know, credit risk. I was inside of a bank. I mean, I know how it works from the inside. Um, you, you, you do make those, those bad loans. In, in good times, you know, anybody can make a loan. The, the trick is to, to to get it paid back. Um, but you know, when you look at, I, I do this analysis every year in my letter to clients, and I uh, it's posted publicly, where I look at the, the S and P five hundred, and the S and P puts out this great data set on the S and P, and it's an interesting exercise to go look at. Um, you can look at operating earnings per share. You can look at the, the debt per share, cash per share, buybacks. Um, and and if, if you look at the S&P 500 as a business, you know, one business, they've, they've taken on debt over the last, you know, decade or so. Earnings have increased just a little bit, but, but not to the extent that the 
price would have you believe, right? So they've bought back a ton of shares, increased their debt loads, you know, really have put themselves in, in as a whole in not not as great a financial position as they they could be. But you know that that to me, I, I guess again, I, I kind of look at these things. It's interesting, and to the extent that it causes panic or it causes a drop in the market or there's spillover effects, you know, that's, that's great if those things happen in a, in a business that I've been following for a while and I want to buy and there's this moment of irrationality and, you know, as value investors, we can spend the time to get to know businesses and, you know, we, we, we don't have to just trade day to day or week to week or month to month. It's like, you know, with Berkshire, follow it for, for years, <clears throat> excuse me. And, you know, if a, if a macro event causes the price to become crazy, you know, take advantage of it. So that, that's kind of my attitude to investing. All right. Well, Adam, that's been amazing learning about what you've said about investing and focusing more on bottoms up and how you're studying businesses to keep tabs on their performance and still determining what makes sense as an investment in spite of some of the risks going on in the markets or in the global economy. I know that there will always be things going on, but if we can cut through the noise and figure out what's a right investment that makes sense for us and, and our investing temperament, I think that seems to be a key takeaway from what you're saying. Yeah, that, that's right. And, and it's, it, it's an ongoing thing. You know, it's really, um, it, it, you know, I, I call myself a, a practicing capital allocator. You know, it's, 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 you know, like a practicing lawyer or a practicing doctor, like it, it's, continual learning is the name of the game. And, you know, uh, I think you had mentioned earlier, Buffett adapting his style from Ben Graham, you know, we, we, we each have to make it our own. And, you know, Guy Spear helped me really solidify that thinking, which is, you know, no one except Warren Buffett is Warren Buffett. And so, you know, it's almost a, um, you know, it takes a little burden off your shoulders to say, oh my gosh, you know, this guy is Incredible, you know, how can I be like him? But you don't, you don't, you'll, you'll, you never will be. So don't put that pressure on yourself. And it actually is, is a little bit uh, relieving. So, you know, you just continue a lifelong study uh, of investing and, you know, just keep that curiosity, I think is the most important thing. Yeah, most definitely. And, and thank you so much, Adam, for speaking with me today. I, I think that um, it was amazing learning more about your investing approach and what you thought about some of these things and what's going on in markets and what's the latest going on with Warren and Charlie. And I've been really grateful to get to learn a lot from you. And I look forward to meeting you at the Berkshire Hathaway meeting. And I wish you all the best as well in all of your future endeavors. No, I appreciate it, Michelle. No, it's, uh, it's exciting to see your enthusiasm for Berkshire. I hope you keep it up. I'm sure you will. And, um, you know, if uh, any anybody listening at this point, certainly appreciate, you know, listening, uh, listening in. And, um, you know, I'd certainly be happy to answer any questions that come up in, in the comments or, you know, on Twitter. Um, you know, it's, it's fun for me as well, you know, being, being, you know, sort of in this, this teaching role and, and sharing what I've learned uh, actually helps me as well. So uh, this was a lot of fun, Michelle.